Wonderful. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, welcome everyone. I'm Tanuja Gupta. I'm based here in New York. I'm an engineering program manager at Google and a tech worker activist. I will say for the record that today's talk is not a Google sponsored talk. Um, everything you hear today is said in a very personal capacity. Um, so we're not reflecting the views of Google as a company. So I'm very personally thrilled um, to be here with Cast Equity Activist and founder of Equality Labs, the Nuri Sandarajan. Sandarajan, um, she's a leading expert in this field. She ran the groundbreaking survey on caste oppression that many of you have seen. Um, it's the first one done in the US. It started a national dialogue. So you've probably heard her in some interviews with major news organizations like NPR, uh, which a new one came out yesterday, the New York Times, BBC, WashPo. Um, and this is what actually prompted commission to um, Congress to commission the first ever open hearing cast on caste discrimination. Um, so her work and testimony have been pivotal in the recent Cisco worker caste-based discrimination. And she's also on the board of Me Too International. I will just add that her book uh, hits newsstands on November and it starts actually with a forward by the Me Too movement founder, Tarana Burke. Uh, so without any further ado, Murray, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we have hundreds of people that have kind of joined today's call or streaming it, things like that. And so many of them had never actually heard about caste or even what the term like Dalit actually meant. So I'd love if you could just start at the beginning. What is the caste system? Sure. And Tanuja, thank you so much for hosting this conversation, particularly as we go from, you know, Dalit History Month <laughs> um, into Asian American Month. You know, conversations like this are really important, um, especially when we know, like, for the Asian American community, hate crimes rose up to 339% just in the last year. So the only way to stop harm is to actually talk about it. So I am really grateful for you for creating this space for us to get into it. Now, I think one of the strange things about caste is that, you know, most people kind of get introduced to it like sometime in um, sixth grade. And when you're taught about the caste system, it makes you think about something later in history. It's sort of, it's a system, so it doesn't seem as bad, you know, just like the race system. But the reality is, is these systems of exclusion, you know, whether it's race or caste are so debilitating because um, the less we talk about it, the, the less data that we have that we understand how that exclusion works, the more that that system continues. And when we're talking about caste, we're talking about one of the oldest systems of exclusion in the world. You know, it has its origins in 2000 BC. It impacts over over 1.9 billion people in the world. Um, and it has its ori origins in South Asia in scripture, but is now found in all religious communities. So it's not as if the opposite of talking about caste is a, a particular religion, it's, it's its own structure of exclusion. And the thing that's so difficult, I think, to understand is that, you know, when you talk about caste, you know, you're basically born into a family. Um, your family is given a level of spiritual purity based on their ancestral job. And then that determines the whole of your life. So if you're at the top of that system, you end up dealing with a lot of, um, you know, benefits as a, as a experience to that. And the, the more you go down the caste pyramid, you know, more, the more and more exclusion that we see people face. So it's something that is not just measured by interpersonal or even internal understandings. We actually have to look at the structural data behind how long caste has kind of existed within South Asia and the kinds of discrimination that caste oppressed people face. And for someone like myself who is Dalit and untouchable, um, you know, that exclusion can be deadly, you know, because we face greater, you know, outcomes in terms of, you know, the lack of access to education, lower literacy rates, lower health rates. Um, you know, on every single development measure, we are the most underdeveloped across the region. So it's like the singular axis of inequity in South Asia. And what's so troubling, I think, about caste is that it's not just in South Asia. It actually, you know, goes across um, the region. And so it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to kind of manage and deal with. I'm glad you started the framing with that, because I think sometimes the conversation is like, oh, this is just in India, and it's just if you are in the Hindu religion. I know you and I are both 
originally from India or parents have immigrated from there. Um, but you're saying this is across the entire region. It's not specific to one religion. Um, I think then like the question, if, you, if you've got this massive hierarchical system, you've said that Dalits are basically not even in the system because of the spiritual purity and pollution. Can you talk a little bit more like what that means? Sure, of course. So I think for most folks who don't have, have never even really heard about what um, untouchability is, untouchables represent the caste at the very bottom of this system. And we're seen as untouchable because we are spiritually defiling to other castes because of the kinds of jobs that we do. So we pick up the sewage of other communities. We dispose of the different carcasses of other communities. Um, it's basically the most despicable labor in the world is given to our communities. Um, but I think that, you know, we, we do not like the term untouchable. You know, it's an epithet, actually, because it's saying that we are defiling before God. So for us, we eschew that and we use lots of different terms, but one of the most common terms is that of Dalit, meaning that which is broken, uh, but resilient. And it's a political term very similar to the way that um, black communities use the term black to identify themselves in a form of dignity and assertion. So within that context, you know, caste oppressed people um, are found in countries all around the world. And in the United States, you see caste oppressed people in many different industries, you know, whether they've been trafficked into domestic workers or working in, you know, um, unorganized labor, like in people's personal shops or as construction workers or um, as restaurant workers, you name it. So it's, it really becomes a much larger labor issue transnationally because we are some of the most exploited workers around the world. That's super helpful because I think one question I got as we were planning this talk of like, but she's an activist in the U.S. If this is a South Asian problem, why is activism here? Um, and, you know, obviously I'm from tech. We've got a lot of people from tech. Can you talk a little bit about what caste discrimination looks like in tech itself here in the U.S.? Sure. And I think that one big kind of first step for folks that are, you know, dialing in from North America is that while, we, while our companies are headquartered here, um, the framework of how we understand race in North America doesn't apply transnationally to other regions of the world. So we actually need to even, you know, expand out our understanding of DEI so much more larger to be able to understand internal hegemonies like in the context of South Asia when it comes to caste. But, you know, what we've seen in the United States is that wherever South Asians go, they bring caste with them. So every industry that has a large amount of South Asian participants or might have South Asian owners, you start to see these like caste dynamics. And in our own research, we found that, you know, when we conducted a survey about caste discrimination in the United States, you know, one out of four um, caste oppressed people experience some physical or verbal assault, one out of three discrimination in education, and two out of three workplace discrimination. So in tech, what we see, which is a field very much dominated by um, South Asian talent, um, both in the region and here, um, is that we see all of the kind of hallmarks of hostile workplaces, uh, but in the dynamic of caste. So we see the use of open slurs, we see harassment, um, we see people aggressively trying to identify someone's caste background, and that might seem unusual for someone that's South Asian, because it's like, well, isn't that a part of your identity? And I think the way to think about it is, is that if someone is trans or queer and they're closeted, you, you might not want to be out. For example, let's say that you work in a company that's a tech company in the Middle East or in another area where there is, you know, um, you know a lack of protections for queer folks or trans folks to be out, it is your right to choose when you are openly identifying as your background. The same thing is true for caste uh, oppressed peoples. And so the, the, the intimidation that happens when people try to aggressively locate your caste and then the resulting things that happen where you start to face open discrimination, demo, demotions, um, even siloing and termination are, are heartbreaking, you know? So I think this is why the Cisco case was so significant is that the California Department for Fairness and Employment and Housing doesn't launch open litigation until it's done its own investigation. 
So it investigated thoroughly the claims of John Doe. And based on what they heard, they said, this is definitely a civil rights issue. And for anyone that's cast oppressed that's listening or as a manager that's listening, you know, so many cast oppressed workers feel intimidated and scared to come forward because they're not just worried about losing their job. If they're an H-1B worker, they might be afraid of losing their status. Um, and for many cast oppressed workers, because the, the professional networks are so tight, you know, within South Asian spheres, they're worried about it haunting them for the terrain of their entire trajectory as a tech as a as a developer so i think for that reason um there's a lot that we can discuss around cast equity that helps to create safer spaces for all workers and um and have more you know courageous conversations about what what is happening related to cast and ways that we might heal around yeah. it and create you know a, a place where i would hope that more Dalit workers feel open to come out well, this is the thing, right? So I think um, we've got some folks who may have never actually heard of what an H-1B visa is. And so do you, do you mind just kind of talking about that and like the framing of the Cisco team? Because that was a landmark case yes. that's been open. Yeah. So for a lot of folks who, you know, aren't quite, you know, uh, savvy in terms of what's going on on the immigration side is that, you know, in the early 90s, there was a class of visas that was really designed to kind of help kind of catapult and expedite um, some of the labor needs of the tech industry in part. Um, and so there are visas like the H-1B visa and the L visa that basically allow, um, you know, tech, tech companies to hire um, workers in a particular class. Um, it may or may not lead to green cards as, you know, there's a select number of them, but you basically are hiring a permanent class of workers that stay at a particular salary range and who are dependent on the company for their visa status. This, frankly, you know, because that's the the one challenge is, is that if you lose your job, you lose your visa status. So there's always this big, you know, end at the end of your immigration, like, am I going to get renewed? Where do I get renewed? It's tied to your performance. And it's not, um, it's not like other visas, like say the O visa or the green card visa, where your status is independent of your employer. You know, so it's like, you know, let's say you decide you want to leave in a, you know, your, a university you might be at and you're like, oh, I'm going to go to somewhere else. You don't have that choice because of how dependent you are in that situation. So it creates a very trepidatious situation for workers, especially cast depressed workers who, you know, from our research make up a large, a large amount of H-1B workers because you do not want to lose your status, especially if you're the first generation to have become educated. It's not just about supporting you, you're supporting a whole bunch of family members back at home, you know? Absolutely. It, it's such a catch 22 if, if, in this scenario and not, I mean the Cisco case, like that whole team was Indian. And so I definitely have over the last couple of weeks as people have been exploring, they're like, but why would you do this with like to your own, if you will? And it's like, there's a whole layered structure here um, that we have to talk about. So, okay, let's, let's dive a little bit further into tech because um, some of the biggest tech companies are actually where people get their news, right? So whether it's on search engines like Google search or Microsoft Bing um, or on social media, you know, like Facebook and, and Twitter. So we've got a lot of people that are either with the news team or they work on content moderation teams at these companies. What would you advise them to be on the lookout for? in terms of matters of cast um, in the news? Sure, well, I think there's like a couple of things, like right off the bat, I think that, you know, the, the cast competency of a company basically informs um, the kind of workforce that can then support the coverage of huge marginalized communities like cast depressed people. So I definitely think there's a huge kind of like front level start where you want to include cast in all of your non discrimination policies because it helps build the opportunities for equity conversation so that people kind of, you know, oftentimes when people don't know a, a structure of exclusion, they tiptoe around it because they're afraid of failing how to cover it properly. So you want to basically empower people people around this issue. Um, so I think that's one thing I would say right off the bat. The second thing is, is that what we've seen around moderation and, um, and how social media companies like kind of tackle these issues of caste and religious hate speech 
is that um, they have basically entered these markets without that competency built. And as a result, there is a normalization of casteist and religious hate speech. And that's been very, very challenging for minority journalists, um, uh, whether they're caste or religious minorities. Um, you know, many, many journalists, you know, think about and talk right about how journalists is one of the most dangerous professions at this time and and that they need more support they want to be able to have you know fast pipelines for escalation they want to be um, uh, want to so being able to have an open door policy for um, you know human rights defenders journalists and academics is one way to kind of ensure Free speech is, you know, working in the platform, but free speech is also working in tandem with like the safety and the integrity of those products, right? Um, and then I think when we come to journalism itself, I think one of the things that you have to think about when we're thinking about South Asia is that a lot of non-South Asians um, often don't know how to cover an axis of inequity like caste. And so they miss opportunities to bring a structural lens to problems that, you know, you would never, for example, in the United States, talk about climate change without talking about racial justice and environmental justice. That's been a push that's come from BIPOC communities. Similarly, for every major development issue that you might cover in South Asia, there is almost always a caste lens. So being able to train, um, you know, non South Asian journalists to be able to ask those bigger questions, while also creating platforms to support cast oppressed journalists to create global, you know, connections to global audiences, because, you know, from some of the initial data that's out there, and there's this really great Oxfam report that talks about who tells our stories matters. And in that report, you find that, you know, of the, you know, 120 newsrooms, not a single newsroom had an editor that came from a cast depressed background. So the question of diversity isn't just do we have Dalit journalists, it's actually who is setting the paradigms for what is covered about our community. And so when you don't have that editorial engagement from the oppressed, what ends up happening is very disconnected stories that don't really connect the dots as to why exclusion is happening. So take, for example, the issue of, um, you know, how caste is covered in the United States. I mean, in, I'm sorry, in South Asia, you'll often see, you know, in, individual incidences of Dalit raped here, Dalit lynched there, you know, oh, we don't know, but this housing colony was destroyed, we don't know why. And so first of all, the fact that they show the cast of the person that's harmed but not the cast of who's doing it and also the structures of power that they're connected to means that the audience is not able to say, well, isn't there someone responsible? Isn't there a point where we might intervene? So I think that there's a lot that can be done just even in uplifting a solutions journalism, journalism model around these issues so that people don't feel paralyzed at you know, the, the enormity of the kind of violence and exclusion that people are facing, but that they can center on actually things that are working. So, you know, as someone who's a survivor and who has worked a lot on gender based issues, you know, I've been so paralyzed by how Dalit rape, for example, is is talked about, you know, caste based sexual violence is such an enormous impact, like two out of three Dalit women have experienced some form of sexual violence due to their caste background. And these are very much performative crimes where women are targeted as a way to shame the overall community from ever asserting themselves in their context. However, one thing that I love is that if you just tell that story, that's a, that's a heartbreaking story. It's a story that needs to be told. There's no point where the audience might see hope, right? So there is like this wonderful organization called Jan Sahas, which actually has taken this problem and developed a very innovative solution because, you know, in the issue of Dalit rape, I think only 0.01% of those cases are ever brought to, um, prosecution. So what John Sahas did is they trained Dalit women survivors to be their own lawyers. And when they did that, that led to a 20% rise in convictions against caste rapists. So that awesome. was such a phenomenal yeah. Yeah, <laughs> thing, absolutely. right? And you all of a sudden see the opening, you're like, yes, I can really see that there, you know? This is, I mean, there's so many parallels, I think, in how we talk about race in this country as opposed to, you know, caste in, in South Asia. And like this idea, I mean, 
newsroom diversity, the top of the thing that you start about, who's actually providing and telling the stories. And then when you always associate um, an underrepresented minority group with with mayhem and bad news, as opposed to solutions and how they are their own heroes. And that's this part of the story we have to tell. And I think there's so many stories that we we miss because we don't understand the nuance of this um, and don't bring that like, holistic perspective. That That's phenomenal. I, um, I would be curious, like when you look at kind of modern, modern current events and stories, um, whether they're here in the US or in, in South Asia, are there some that you're like, hmm, the full story is not being told right now? Like just kind of news stories that I think like folks maybe in the audience haven't necessarily been able to connect those dots because they're learning about cast as well right now. Sure. Well, what, just to kind of like think about how big of an access cast might hit, you know, I mentioned at the top of my talk that 1.9 billion people in the world are impacted or live in a region where cast exists. That's one out of four people in the world. So you should think about the fact that every single development issue we may want to talk about will have a cast angle. But just in the last two weeks, like two, you know, one thing that I was really thinking about was Elon Musk's um, you know, uh, bid for Twitter. And, you know, a lot of the conversations around free speech that was being brought up was about his notion of left versus right and his partisan framing of free speech, which is a very North American US centric way to look at free speech. But and then in the course, the, as he was doing that, he also targeted their head of legal, who's also the head of safety, Vijaya Gade, right? And the thing that most people don't realize is there are other there are other markets that all of these companies work in, including Google, um, that actually are much larger than the U.S. market, and their frames around free speech are not just left and right; they actually have to do with like local hierarchies of concern, and you know, and Vijaya Gade was actually someone who was at Twitter during this very pivotal moment around cast. And I don't know if folks like remember this, but there was a point where Vijaya and Jack went to India and some of, one of them had like a poster of mine that I had, there's two posters, one that said end cast apartheid, the other said smash Brahminical patriarchy. And he, he, he took a photo with the smash Brahminical patriarchy and that launched an entire conversation about gender-based violence and caste as a result of that. And, but it was the first time Vijaya as the head of safety had ever even heard of cast and that it was a major issue for their market. And so because of that work and that advocacy, you know, just this year, you know, Twitter formally added cast in multiple categories for their moderation and hate speech. So in, in many ways, like I think we cannot look at the, the ownership of such a large global platform without understanding how it impacts minorities around the world in their own respective markets. And so in that end, when he targets someone like Vijaya that has that institutional history that there's been some slow transformation on, you know, she has some of the competency that he lacks. And so journalists can really fill in the gaps around that by, by pointing to, oh, hey, here was another past moment, like what would Musk say about this thing, especially since Musk is trying to get into the Indian market, you know, because of Tesla. So will he sacrifice his needs, you know, the needs for free speech and the protection of users in order to support his other businesses? Those are all great coverage points that a lens on cast would actually open up so much understanding around that story. Absolutely, absolutely agreed. Um, and I, I have a few more questions that I want to ask before we open up for Q&A. So folks, if you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat. Um, we'll make sure to take them. I, I think another area, you know, when you and I were kind of getting to this talk together, another area was around um, the cab law in, in India. And, you know, there's been a lot of news in the last couple of years. So I understand like people may not be familiar. Do you mind talking a little bit about that law and the camps and kind of like also the UP elections may be of interest as well, and just what your your thoughts are well, on how cast coverage is in there. Yep. Sure. So I I would say that you know for folks that don't know you know in in India there was a law called the Citizenship Amendment Act that really brought into contestation the notion of citizenship for India for the first time, and it was very controversial, particularly because there were camps that were being built to 
denaturalized millions of people in that process. And that that process basically, while the camps were built, it's been slowed quite intensely because of um, COVID, you know, so as the restrictions slowed, those might open. Um, but I think that, you know, very sensitive issues like the CAA, but also like what we're seeing in Sri Lanka with the, the protests there around the Rajpaksa regime and how they determined resource allocation in the face of this moment, as well as, um, you know, what we're seeing in terms of unrest in Pakistan and in Bangladesh and in um, Nepal, all of these democracies like our democracies that are struggling under the weight of, um, you know, uh, declining um, dem democratic standards, especially as it relates to minorities, um, whether religious or caste based. And so being able to, you know, succinctly be able to talk about those issues where you're providing unbiased coverage, you're able to center minorities in the, the framing and the shaping of that conversation is so critical because, you know, again, as a global, you know, as a global market, you know, we are concerned with what, you know, violations of human rights. We don't want people in camps. We don't want people starving and having, you know, um, you know, situations where um, they are being politically imprisoned. So there is a lot to kind of look at in each of these democracies that is going to require um, thoughtful coverage in order for us to be able to make informed decisions as global citizens. So um, there is, you know, this there is a lot of like work. related to that and definitely journalists yeah in um, in um, one person I would recommend is Mina Kotal who is a very famous Dalit journalist who covers these issues also Sadip Domando who's the editor of the news minute he's also a very strong journalist that has covered this at work um, Rana Ayub is another Indian Muslim journalist who has also been journalists and writers like Sarita Pariyar, um, who have really shed light, you know, in the Kathmandu Post and in others about the plight of Nepali community. So, you know, what's important, I think, just like what we're seeing in the United States is that you have historically marginalized communities who have their rights based concerns around their path towards dignity. And that also intersects with larger historical phenomenon and challenges that are, you know, occurring, you know, so, for example, we all woke up to this like crazy news about Roe versus Wade, you know, who is that going to disproportionately affect, you know, BIPOC young women and girls and their families, you know, same thing in South Asia, whatever terrible policy that might be, you know, passed along by different institutions, the most vulnerable of that are going to be the caste oppressed and religious minorities. So that's why we need to build that literacy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you are doing the work to make that happen. And we skipped to like very heavy topics. The last question I want to ask you is just, can you share a little bit about your story, how you came to be an activist in this fight and like what frankly like keeps you going? Well, you know, I think my my parents actually keep me going. You know, I'm sure Tanuja, your parents have their stories about how they came here with five dollars in their pocket. And, you know, I always have this like really, um, you know, touching memory of my dad and I protesting with Professor Cornell West in front of the White House for caste equity. And my dad was a little bit in shock when he was there. He was like, you know, it was almost 40 years ago that I was at the YMCA and I had $5 when I immigrated and I was doing my residency and I didn't know how it was going to turn out, you know, let alone that I would have the freedom to protest in the way that I did. And, you know, in big ways and small ways, my parents suffered a lot to come here. You know, they they were the first in their families to get educated and they immigrated because they, they knew that they would not be able to manage the violence of where they were at. And so they hoped for a better life here. And I think it was, you know, I think that a lot of people, if you guys have ever heard of that thing called the talk, where, you know, um, black families have to talk to their children about what it is to be dehumanized. And, you know, Dalit families also have our version of the talk. And I think my parents never expected that they would have to share that with their their two daughters because they thought they were free here you know um but you know everywhere south asians go they recreate caste and you know my family it what you know i grew up hindu and um christian and so my family was very connected to the community of the temple and and southern california 
And it was it was hard, you know, because they had they were always hiding. And for anyone that's ever had family that's been in the closet, um, it's a very painful experience because you see them be lesser versions of, the, of themselves all the time. So my dad didn't come out as Dalit until he was 73. So I watched him hide his whole life. And my mom also hid because she's Christian. And so most people understand Christians to be caste depressed in the South Asian context. So even though we lived in like we lived in a two bedroom house in um, Orange County, my mom had um, our place where she would pray to um, to cry. Like in a closet in close the blinds open up the closet, bring out her prayer book, and then she would pray. And I, as a child, I didn't understand it. I was like, why is she like, why are we in, why, <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> and, um, you know, and then I, you know, to, to kind of, was, and so as their child here, I understood caste by watching the trauma of my family and also seeing other dominant caste members treat me with great bigotry, you know, people changing plates and using slurs towards me or, you know, blocking me after I spoke and, you know, it's, um, you know, it's very real when I say that I'm a survivor of caste violence because I experienced both direct violence towards disgusting tactics to try to silence and diminish like the experience of, you know, my people. Um, but I also think that every time there has been um, ill treatment, there's always been an ally. You know, there's always been someone who's extended that kind of connection of humanity in the darkness and said, no, we're not going to allow that. Come on now. <laughs> let's let's be human together. And I think that taught me to not be afraid. That taught me not to uh, not to 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 have the courage to come out of the closet and that that, you know, for me, those folks were really um, amazing, you know, women of color leaders um, in California, you know, and so I was like, you know, I was very lucky to grow up in, you know, to go to school in the Bay Area. And so folks like Linda Burnham from the Women of Color Research Center and Margo Okazawa Ray from the Combahee Collective and, you know, many, many other um, women, elder women of color, you know, that made space for me to have language around my intersectional experience around caste and gender so that I could be here as a Dalit leader to talk about um, equity and justice and care in the face of these violences. So, you know, in many ways, you know, while I experienced exclusion, I also think I experienced the like very kind of seductive taste of freedom with all of these different relationships. And, and in many ways want to, you know, in the work of Equality Labs, that's our hope too, is that, you know, when people get to know Dalit people and when they get to know about the challenges that we face, that it's not just our struggle, it's actually an interconnected struggle with many other communities and that we have so much to learn from each other. When we lose these systems of exclusion, we can regain our humanity with each other. Beautifully, beautifully put. Absolutely. And we're so lucky that you're here talking to us and inspiring us. So I could ask you more questions all day, but I won't because other people have questions. Um, so let me, let me dive into these and folks can keep um, posting. They're more than welcome to keep asking. Okay. So the first one that I see here is from Anonymous. Um, and they ask, there's a lot of organized effort as well as ignorant belief cultivated in the last few years that paints any Dalit movement as anti-Hindu or Hindu phobic. Anything that even remotely mentions Hindu or Veda or any other description, uh, scripture in connection with Dalit suppression or problems of the Dalit community is often taken as um, or spun as an attack on personal beliefs and faith by many um, in the Hindu community, not all, but many. How, first of all, have you seen that as well? Um, and then second, kind of how do you change that narrative? So I thank you, Anonymous, for asking that question. So I, I speak as someone who's of Hindu descent. So, you know, both from someone who had been within the Hindu community as well as someone who grew up Christian and, you know, am now a Buddhist. And what I can say with confidence is that caste cuts across all of these religious communities. So you will see, 
people who disagree with caste equity in many different religious contexts. And it's why it's important to separate out the context of caste and the concerns around caste discrimination from any sort of religious conversation because um, it is its own protected category and it's how it's recognized both in law and in the intergovernmental treaties that we're a signatory to in the United States. But that said, I think this question is really about how do we handle fragility, you know, because we don't have to entertain any of the gaslighting frames about, oh my gosh, if you're talking about caste, you're being Hindu phobic, but that's just a patent gaslighting technique. And I don't know if anyone has heard of um, this, you know, this framework called DARVO, which is, you know, um, it's a it's a framework that comes out of um, domestic violence, but it's basically a way that you see um, opponents to a conversation around equity or harm basically refer, you know, you know, reverse who is the victim and who is the offender here. And so um, I don't think we enter into that category. I think what we have to do is actually create more compassionate places for dialogue and discourse. Because again, There's no framework in which I'm Hindu phobic because I'm owners of the Hindu temple in uh, in Southern California. I've made a choice, you know, as a caste oppressed person to choose a different faith and also to question some of the origins of my own oppression. And that's, you know, in that way, Dalits really carry a similar experience of being survivors of spiritual violence as people who come from, you know, who are, you know, child sexual abuse survivors with the Catholic Church or indigenous communities who question the role of Christianity with um, with colonization to to call out what happened historically is not a referendum on any one faith it's to tie, to really specifically lay out what led us to this moment of this system of exclusion being built absolutely absolutely what I have seen with people that are very activated around Dalits asking for equity, Dalits like, you know, needing to, you know, require extra support uh, in order to be able to operate in institutions without discrimination. Those are our civil rights to ask for. Those are our civil rights that are actually legally required by institutions to serve us. Those our rights and us being able to get rights is not taking away the rights from any other community. All it does is that if you are discriminatory, you will face consequences. <laughs> That's it. If you don't discriminate, you won't face any consequences. But I think just like the critics of critical race theory who target you know, scholars like Kimberly Crenshaw um, for talking about race and the history of slavery, there is, this, there is this phenomenon of people who are privileged, who find questions and conversations around equity, equity very disturbing to their nervous systems. And so their nervous systems, once activated, now view equity as something that triggers them from a survival space. So I think what we do is we don't change policies and we don't let you know the frameworks that we have to do around our, our legal responsibilities towards civil rights shift because our nervous systems are not able to tolerate diversity, we actually work with them on their nervous systems, you know, and I think this is where I've really seen a lot of powerful work around caste and race mindfulness, be able to de-escalate people to be able to have the ability to disagree, the ability to have courageous conversations, and the reality is, is no one is going to take away anyone's right to practice the religion that they want in adding caste as a protected category. All it does is make sure that caste oppressed people have equal access to an institution like everyone else. And there is a deep you know, body of practitioners who are dominant caste, who come from you know, dominant caste religious traditions and Christianity and Islam and um, Hinduism and Sikhism, who are taking on that responsibility to challenge their dominant caste peers around this gaslighting frame of Hindu phobia as the opposition to caste equity. And more than anything, I have empathy because when someone feels like they're in a survival place, that's a terrible place to be. It's not real. They're caught in their own trauma world, but someone needs to de-escalate them out of that trauma world. It's not the role of the oppressed, but it's the role of allies and people who are privileged. And it's the role of institutions to not let the flow of progress be impeded by people who are traumatized, you know, and not really able to participate in, you know, conversations about equity in a meaningful way. Thank you for that. I think this has been a big question for a lot of people. Um, so I'm really appreciative of that, that answer. 
Um, the next question here is from Gautam. It says, greatly appreciate your work here. The visibility is important in this country. I have always been wondering, how do we stop the perpetuation of this to the next generations? Do you think something um, that happens in the Southern state of India is a way to go where affirmative action has actually made more representation from the oppressed class, um, like owning a TV network and hence journalist representation? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, <clears throat> you know, again, caste is a, a system of exclusion that has so many different dimensions. So you certainly need political and economic interventions that can address the exclusion that caste oppressed people face in those um, in those institutions. So affirmative action has always been an effective measure when it's properly implemented. And Um, but I also think that we need to talk about the psychosocial and the need to heal, because oftentimes when we push forward with political and economic change, but we haven't actually addressed historical harm and the way that people carry of the trauma around issues, you know, and I think about that a lot, a lot with the work of um, the Equal Justice Initiative in in the South, um, where, you know, part of the way that they want to address the pain of historical harm is through monuments and through story circles, you know, so there's a really beautiful lynching museum that really gives, you know, um, context and an emotional container for the incredible grief that exists for black folks about the tyranny of white supremacy in the South and the ways that black bodies were sacrificed for the, the property, um, you know, aspirations of white families there. And I think similarly, you know, when we don't talk about the pain that we carry within South Asian communities, both for the caste privileged and the caste oppressed, we really just keep repeating this cycle of violence, which is one of the reasons why I'm really a proponent of both mindfulness and courageous conversations around these issues, because we are better prepared to think about visionary strategies around the exclusion when our nervous systems are settled, when we've actually reckoned with our own family lineages related to these problems, and then can start to build authentic relationships with each other. I feel like we don't actually have a lot of authentic relationship with each other because we're still seeing each other through our historical pain, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. And that space for like reconciling these truths, but and it's on both sides, both like the caste of privilege and caste oppressed because caste privilege are carrying a lot, a lot of guilt of being complicit in this system as well. And they need to come to terms with it to move on um, and be good allies. I think this is um, the next question I wanna ask. It requires a little bit of background. So the question asks, how do we tackle the notion that affirmative action like reservation is creeping on rights of the general population? Um, but I'm not sure everyone knows what the reservation is because of the admittance practice in colleges in India. Do you mind giving a little background and then sure. giving your thoughts? So for folks that are hearing reservation for the first time, reservation is actually one of the first affirmative action policies in global history. Um, you know, it actually even predates our own affirmative action policies here in the United States. But it was set up with the idea to kind of help uh, address historical harm that caste oppressed people faced and in South Asian societies you see reservation um, being given you know from institutions that are like education where they might reserve a particular um, set of um, admission seats for people from caste oppressed and religious minority backgrounds to even electoral seats in parliament. Um, and some private companies also have um, affirmative action policies, you know, so it is a big part of South Asian society and it's a flashpoint because there's a lot of resentment um, related to um, you know, cast oppressed people um, getting those, you know, getting some of that intervention to deal with their, you know, existing structural exclusion at the expense of people, what they say, general category seats or people that don't have affirmative action, which are made up of upper caste or what they'll say is for forward caste. And, you know, I think that this becomes a huge flashpoint within tech companies because it's one of the number one discussions of caste is whether or not, um, a, you know, reservation should exist, 
also employees that were Dalit that actually benefited from reservation if they're actually worthy employees or are they diversity candidates with a lot of like snide comments, um, sometimes even bordering on eugenic conversations where Brahmin castes are seen as like intellectually fit and much stronger than, you know, weak, you know, policy babies um, like that, you know, that Dalits are referred to. And I, I think that, you know, this is really the wrong frame to address. You know, the, the issue is, is that when you think about historical harm in North America, after hundreds of years of slavery, we only had 40 years, uh, 40 to 40 years of affirmative action. And we still see, you know, black communities and indigenous communities and in some of the same challenging issues. So, you know, if you look at a country like India, for example, it's very clear that while there are some Dalits that have made it, there are still many that are stealing, dealing with historical exclusion and historical lack of generational wealth, you know. So I don't think the issue is that we get rid of affirmative action, um, but I think what we don't do is fall into the frame that, you know, these are unworthy candidates, you know, uh, and we don't even give airtime to whether or not affirmative action to ex exists, but we actually go upstream and ask ourselves, like, in a country that is as young as India, for example, if there is so many people that are hungry for education, we should be investing in more education for all, not targeting the most poor and the most vulnerable that are struggling for access, we should just create more seats. That's a much more expansive and visionary approach than just hammering over and over and over again. Um, that caste depressed people are not as worthy. When what I have seen is that Dalit workers, you know, they show up up early, they're the last to leave, they in very fearful conditions of being outed. Um, and despite that, you know, they still succeed, you know, so sometimes it's just about having um, the right intervention and a supportive environment. And that's why, you know, when you look at, you know, companies like Google's own diversity goals, you know, Google diversity basically looks at um, when they're looking at BIPOC communities, they're thinking about a paradigm that says from cradle to career. So everything about what it takes to create a diverse, uh, you know, a diverse workforce in terms of race, it's about where all of the interventions that can be made from K through 12, through college, through apprenticeships, you know, you have to have an entire pipeline to allow marginalized communities to succeed, not because we're less than, but because of all of the structural bias that we face in all the institutions that take place before we even sit down to get hired, right? The same thing is true for caste depressed people. And so I could imagine that if there is a conversation that breaks out around reservation, or if you're seeing offensive terms related to caste depressed people and those policies, um, it's important to speak up and be an upstander, um, but also to be able to look at structural upstanding. You know, are there ways that we can build greater pathways of opportunity for caste depressed people, particularly in projects that would involve South Asia and, and really want to look at the next billion set of users. Those next billion users in South Asia are caste depressed because they're the last to get online. So a diverse workforce really makes good business sense because you'll have products that really speak to the needs of those communities. Absolutely. And I think actually that's the perfect segue into this next question where Anonymous asks, how can I help make a difference when I work remotely with Indian colleagues in India and the US? I knew about the caste system, but didn't know discrimination about it existed in the West. What would you advise? Well, I think first thing I want to just make sure that people understand is that caste is actually broader than India. It's across all of South Asia. So, you know, depending on if you're you know, if Google approaches these conversations, just know that issues of caste are going to impact product and workforces across that whole region. So you can be looking and seeing like in, you know, in employee conversation and discourse, are people using caste as terms? Do you see people kind of pushing denigrative comments related to caste oppressed people or religious minorities? Just on a, a flag like that, that is very important to know because oftentimes people uh, feel comfortable using open slurs and discriminatory content because they think that their non-South Asian staff don't know better. But if you see the terrains of discrimination, most people can see when someone is making a mean joke or a biased joke, right? So if you have a question, 
question about it, like reach out to a trusted ally and just do a gut check. And if it's something that's serious, know that it's not your responsibility. This is the whole point of why people have reporting anonymous reporting mechanisms, because that that matters, you know. Um, but I think when it comes to products as well, I think if you're ever kind of doing like a user user study for you know a particular project, you never want to think about a universal um, Indian or Nepali user. You want to think about the ways you might see caste and religious context play into different kinds of user experiences of a tool, a platform, or a process. So making sure that you work with firms that help you build that diversity and um, you know, intelligence into your work can really um, matter, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we are about to run out of time, so we're not going to get through all of these, but I will ask this one last question. Um, and I, I'll add some color to it as well. So this person asks, I am a Dalit female and I don't know a single other Dalit person at Google. There's so much fear of being outed and being discriminated against in our merit and professional success um, being questioned against affirmative action benefits. While there are parallels between caste and race, it's very exhausting as a Dalit in America to have to explain the challenges and complexity of caste from the lens of race to our non-Indian colleagues, especially when we are already feeling so alone internally. Any advice on how to deal with this pressure to properly educate others and the ensuing exhaustion, especially in our tech jobs in America? I will also add, it's not just race. The number of people that they're like, oh, this is like the uh, um, Palestine-Israel um, conflict. And I had to like hold everything back in me to be like, no, it's not, stop it. So um, what would you kind of advise folks, especially this woman? So yeah. I think Akanksha, first of all, thank you so much for your question. And, you know, I'm going to drop my email. If you ever want to reach out and talk, I'd be happy to talk to you. And, you know, I think that's actually one that I can answer, but I would hope that everyone who's listening can also help answer because part of what Tanuja just shared is that the burden to transform institution is not on the excluded. It's on the institution and all of us make up the workplace um, that, you know, we're seeing casteism to occur. And I think when you're that lone publicly dullet out person, it is extremely exhausting because you're not only having to work on your own work product, you have to constantly educate people so that you're in a safe workspace. Oftentimes at the detriment to your own professional goals, because sometimes people don't agree with you or they target you. And, um, say terrible things about you. And there are a lot of Dalit workers that we've had to support who have had to make that hard choice about, um, do I focus on my career or do I focus on caste equity? And I hope that you don't have to do that. Um, and I think that part of, you know, what helps you kind of better manage that is really good boundaries. You know, sometimes, you know, people want to make the work of equity your job when it's actually theirs. So you want to pick your battles really strategically and think about, is this a moment that allows me to adjust structure? Um, do I have the capacity for it, both from like a workload perspective, but also from a nervous system, emotional perspective? And do I have the support that I need, you know? Oftentimes I think because Dalits are so alone in workplaces and, and because many of our community is hidden, until one person comes out, you don't actually know where the other person is. Um, that can be very demoralizing, you know, to take on that risk, you know, by yourself. And so I really recommend that you you have a squad, you know, a little team of equity that could be other workers that you work with. Maybe it's people outside of work, but who know you. You need to have a life outside of the battles of discrimination that you might be trying to address. Because I, I do think that there is a way that, you know, Dalits like other oppressed people um, often take on the burden of fighting and we don't get the, the ability for us to be at ease, to be at peace to be able to build joy around our identity because things are so distressful. But if we are able to prioritize what healing looks like for us, what healing looks like for our community, healing is a very different approach than um, than, uh, than, than just, you know, correcting bad, bad people around you, you know? And that's, that's a centering I think we rarely get to have um, Dalit people, but I would just encourage you to know you're not alone. There are so many 
people who are committed to caste equity. There's an initial group of people here who would certainly love to be your friends so that you don't have to carry this weight alone. Um, but also, I think this goes back to that institutional responsibility is that when you have Dalit workers that are saying they're experiencing a tremendous amount of caste stress and pressure to have to transform workplaces that don't understand their humanity, you're actually seeing challenges related to caste manifest. And so I, I would really say this isn't a conscious problem. This is really a call to action for all of us. Probably represents like thousands of workers, you know, in the company that she's a part of. And so I think that it's really important to, to know that we're in it together and that we are winning. You know, the fact that we're able to have this conversation, we don't have to debate that caste exists anymore, is a hard fought, you know, victory by Dalit people who have really taken um, a lot of vulnerability to fight and to be present. And so I hope that if we have this conversation next year, we'll have an even more larger win to talk about. And there will be hundreds of Akanksha's, you know, being, being loved and cared for and nurtured for by all of their other workers. And Marie, thank you so much for such an engaging conversation. Thank you everyone who tuned in and for all of your great questions. Uh, we hope to keep doing this in the future. Please reach out if you have any other questions as well. Um, and we'll, we'll see you soon. Thank you.